faith in destiny is all I need to prevail. This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. I'd like to welcome everybody out there in Internet land to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon. Here we are. Sorry. Uh, proud guys. <laughs> uh, here we are, April 13th, 2013. What a year so far, huh, Ramon? Yeah, it's quite the amazing year. Um, you know, I feel like there's um, a lot of a lot of a lot of people are expanding and, and growing in their own right. Um, just by you know, just the conversations you have with different people, and it, it's it's always a uh, mind blowing. But speaking of mind blowing, really quick before you bring in our, our guest, which you guys are are gonna love, it's one of my favorite subjects too. Um, there's a, a kid and he's um, a polyglot. Now you're wondering what what's a polyglot? And a polyglot is a person who speaks more than four languages. Okay. This kid is 16 years old, started studying languages when he was eight. He speaks 23 fluent languages. That includes Arabic, Swahili, um, um, I forgot the Native American name one, the ones the uh, Chippewa speak, several different uh, dialects of, of Arabic, he speaks most of all the European languages. Uh, it's just amazing that he speaks 23 different languages. Even there's, I forgot the name of it, there's one language where they speak with, with sounds like and he can speak that language as well. He says that's one of the hardest languages to, to learn. I bet. Um, it's just completely mind, mind blowing. Um, so if you guys look that up. Do you remember what, what, what's the guy's name? I don't remember, but if you put polyglot, it's a uh, poly, P-O-L-Y-G-L-O-T. You put that, and then you put 23 uh, languages, it'll pop up. Wow. Wow, that's, uh, that, that, just, that shows you the, uh, some of the potential we have. Uh, you know, it's, it, and this guy, is this guy, uh, uh, do you know if he's like a savant or something? Um, when they, they did a news thing on him, they didn't mention anything about that. And he did, didn't seem, because he seemed very social when he talks, um, he didn't seem to have any anything. I think he's just one of those, you know, one of those gifted kids that are coming through now. And how old is this kid again? 16. <laughs> wow. So that means he's, yeah, that, you know. Yeah, that, that's Savant right there. For somebody to be able to pick up, you know, that's, ah, uh, man. And I, I have enough. I have enough problem with the English language. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, geez. Yeah. That's so twenty-three of them. Wow. So let's let's tap into some uh, free energy. Oh man, you guys are gonna like this. Uh, we've got Joel Garvin with us tonight. Uh, Joel serves as president of the nonprofit, the New Energy Movement. That's www. The new that. Excuse me www.newenergymovement.org, which educates about breakthrough energy technologies and their implications for human society and our imperiled planet, while also serving as, a, as an advocate organization for inventors of those technologies. He's also a founding member of New Energy Congress, that's newenergycongress.org, which maintains a publicly viewable database of the most promising breakthrough technologies. Garvin's author of a, of a historic legisl legislative draft entitled Energy Innovation Act of 2007, which serves as a template for new en energy legislation on federal, state, local, and international levels. The legislation's provisions call for urgent and serious public support for research and development of breakthrough energy technology 
and was presented to senators and representatives of the United States Congress. Uh, Garvin received a Bachelor of Science degree in Applied Science at, from Miami University, Oxford, Ohio. He, was, he has worked for nearly 30 years in an international industrial science consultant and educator within the chemical, pulp, and paper, water, paper, water treatment, and building products industries. He's the inventor and developer of several successful commercial technologies used within these industries. Jarvin's co-author with investigative journalist Gene Manning of the award-winning book Breakthrough Power, How Quantum Leap New Energy Inventions Can Transform Our World, and that is www.breakthroughpower.net, which chronicles the challenges, opportunities, and progress in the new energy technology field. The authors make the appeal for a tidal wave of wisdom that, that sounds like under monkey to me, and the concurrent evolution of energy technology and human consciousness as foundations for a new era on planet Earth. Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio on the Truth Frequency, Joel Garvin. Hey, thank you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Oh, man, we, we, we talked to you a couple of weeks ago, and that just kind of wet my whistle for uh, what you're all about and what you're doing out there in the world. Uh, man, so tell us a little, uh, that's pretty extensive bio I just read there, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, uh, what, what actually interested you in the whole energy field in the first place? Well, you know, my background is in industrial science. So, you know, after I got out of college uh, with a, a degree in applied science, I entered the pulp and paper and chemical industries as a, a consultant and traveled around a lot all over North and South America primarily and was doing work to help optimize the, uh, the uh, industrial processes in both of those industries, generally to uh, help them become more efficient in the way they were utilizing the chemistry that, that was required so they could use fewer chemicals and reduce costs, increase productivity, all these, these kind of normal things that are of, of interest to industry. And it gave me a chance to really see a lot of the impact of heavy industry on the environment. So, you know, most people who live anywhere near a pulp or paper mill you know, pretty much have an understanding of the big footprint that in a large industrial facility like that has on their community, uh, whether you're detecting it uh, by sniffing the air or whether, you know, you're noticing what the, the state of the forests look like nearby. Uh, you might notice it in the water quality. Uh, that's uh, the result of, of what might be discharged into a river or a lake or a bay from that, that factory. And, uh, you know, in the case of the chemical industry, very similar types of impacts. So, you know, as I had a chance to get an inside look at the environmental impact of, of what heavy industry was doing, it, it really started to waken up my interest in, you know, the environmental sensitivities that I think each of us really have. Uh, but a lot of times those tend to be buried uh, below other priorities that, that we have, whether it's, you know, earning our livelihood or, uh, you know, other, other things that, uh, you know, we feel have our attention at the time. But uh, I, it, was, it was such a persistent experience of mine, especially from the, uh, the deforestation aspects, that, uh, you know, I, I found myself thinking a lot about gosh, what could I do to have an impact on this so that uh, we can go about and have all these, these uh, products and, and services that really enhance our, uh, our experience and, and, you know, that we uh, uh, still have the things that we take for granted, but that we're doing them in a way that doesn't have such a negative environmental footprint. I'll give you a for instance here. So, you know, if you uh, are doing logging on a, uh, a steep hillside like happens uh, quite often here in the Pacific Northwest where I live. I live in Portland, Oregon. Generally, uh, what happens is when you, you do a clear cut on a steep hillside, you get uh, a lot of erosion occurring very rapidly with, with subsequent storm events. 
and that, that will cause a lot of silt to get washed down into formerly pristine uh, streams. And that silt can uh, essentially cover over the spawning beds of salmon and, and other fish species and essentially can, you know, totally and dramatically change the whole aquatic biosphere. And uh, it's, it's certainly unsightly, you know, to see a whole mountainside denuded of its trees. And when yeah. you become, become aware of the impacts on the water quality of the watershed, uh, you know, it's pretty dismaying what, you know, what, what this type of, of uh, harvesting practice can do. So, and Joel, I, Joel yeah. I hate to interrupt you here, but I want to, I want to share something that I experienced here in 2008. I live uh, just north of you, about 90 miles, in Lewis County, Washington. In 2008, there was a, a horrible flood here. And, I mean, it made national news. And it was all uh, a lot of rain, obviously, but uh, the main reason for the flood was a clear cut that had uh, right above a river, and it had mud slided down into the river. So incredibly that I, I was of the US startled, and it, you know, this voice said to me, network. you're to help bring a new form of energy to our planet. And as I, I stood there in uh, just a kind of shock about the only thing I could think to say was, well, oh, you mean solar energy, something like that? And, and the voice had this very, uh, it, it, it was an energetic uh, feeling I got about this voice, in fact, it was smiling. And just simply gently said, no, not like solar energy, but you'll see. And it's and it communicate that in such a, a loving, gentle way, and with with such a, a, a just an unquestionable knowledge that I I just I felt this total trust, and I and I said, okay, I will I will do this, and I felt very strongly that this was my own connection to the divine intelligence that that is very real in my experience and i'm i'm saying this as a scientist who's you know been very grounded in the scientific method and show me the data and doing experiments and working in industry and all this kind of stuff i mean i have i have some very very deep left-brained aspects to myself for sure but here i was having this very profound personal a mystical experience that that to me was more real than any of these other type of things that I'd been engaged in. So I had this confidence in this in this instruction that was given to me, and I committed to it. Well, very very rapidly, I started to find people were coming to me, um, and or or I was having access to them. And they were people involved in the new energy field. Uh, and among the, the first of these uh, were Stephen Greer, uh, and then Brian O'Leary, Gene Manning, uh, Tom Ballone, uh, a number of others who, who were, uh, actually became uh, primary mentors to me. And uh, Brian O'Leary actually had asked me to essentially serve as his right-hand man to help establish this nonprofit educational movement that came to be known as the New Energy Movement, uh, which, which continues on to this day uh, and is ever-strengthening. Uh, the New Energy Movement is a nonprofit that educates about what's going on behind the scenes in the, the breakthrough energy field and helps to uh, have the mainstream public and policymakers and the investment community understand about the implications of us either staying on the current path that, that we're on or making a transformation to a new energy society, a total revolution in how we generate and utilize energy. And to, to communicate that we are all stakeholders in the outcome of that choice. Yeah. And it, it, it's, uh, 
it was an amazing experience for me just to see how, uh, you know, how simply trusting that inner guidance, that doors were just opening right and left. And it, it was, it was an amazing ride and it's continued to this day. And this goes, and like I'm saying, this, this went back to, uh, to the mid nineties. So, uh, you know, so here I am <laughs> and, uh, you know, my role in this, this whole thing seems to, uh, focus around my strength as a communicator, as a networker, and a a bridge between people, and and having people come together as an extended family. Yeah, um, let me um, let, let me jump in real quick because I want to go back to the voice because I've I've experienced that similar. I mean, she didn't say the same thing, but I've experienced that, and what I've noticed it just. I don't know how to explain it, but it feels different, and it's like you don't realize the energy behind your own thoughts and the way it feels. It's just something, the best way I can describe it is like unplugging something and plugging something completely different in when you hear those voices, and then it switches back to your own. Yeah. Is it something like that? Yeah, very much. The thing you definitely know for sure is this is not my own mind. <laughs> this is not my ego chattering away uh, like we normally hear in that whole, uh, you know, kind of stream of consciousness where it seems like there's, you know, several different radio stations, you know, playing yeah. in your mind as you're kind of mindlessly having all these random thoughts just coming in. That, that was not this. In fact, yeah. what, what, what happened right about this same time was that whole stream of consciousness, you know, 100 radio stations playing in my mind, all of that ceased. And it, it was quite startling to me in that now, and, and what has continued to this day, is there is just complete silence between each of my thoughts. I don't get random thoughts coming in anymore. It's just That's there's, a, there's a thought, and then there's just silence, and there's just simply a an, an observational presence until I choose another thought. And sometimes I do choose low-quality thoughts, but I find it very intolerable, and so invariably I will look at it and say, look, I... I choose to release that and, you know, just put it, put it away, that there's no value in that thought. And generally what I'm speaking of are, are thoughts that have something to do with fear or attack or grievance, yeah. you know, any, any of these types of things that tend to uh, pull us back into that little scared ego mind that, that wants to separate everybody away from us. Um, it's and it's inten and intentional thought. It is intentional. Yeah. But, you know, you know what it, it sounds like, um, Joel? Tom, do you remember, I forget the gentleman's name, Enlightenment is not what it's cracked up to be? Do you remember? Oh. Yeah, I remember, the, I remember the book and the conversation, but... Yeah, he was, um, basically he was, I uh, can't remember his name, but this gentleman we had on, he was describing how his enlightenment process and how he, he felt like he reached enlightenment and he was asking other monks and stuff like that. And he's describing the exact same thing as, as, you know, when he has a thought and then he has the silence, but there's like this other part of him that's observing and there's always an awareness. Is, is that what you're... Um, that was Dr. Robert Foreman, by the way. That's okay. it. Yeah. yeah, very, very much like that. And it, it doesn't mean that the ego has gone away because I can tell you for sure, I have my own vanities that, that are always, you know, tempting me to, uh, to start, you know, uh, trivializing and distracting myself with stuff that, that doesn't have a lot of meaning, but, but it's, you know, just kind of these, uh, uh, you know, normal, you know, human, uh, you know, diversionary thoughts. So I, I, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't say that I'm enlightened or anything like that, far from it. But, but I, I, I will say this, in that I Sorry, made the choice. Hold, 
hold on yeah. to that but we're gonna go on to break in a, a few seconds here um okay. you're listening to tom and ramona on the hundredth monkey radio show i know there was some little bit of problem in the beginning but hopefully i didn't fix that and i will talk to you guys after the uh break make sure you call it we'll give out those numbers afterwards Now one more time before I go One last thing you need to know my friend You want to keep it complicated It's really all quite simple in the end You got to tune into your inner being Ah, welcome back to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon and Joel Garbin. I uh, just let you guys know, uh, you live listeners, that uh, uh, we had a little bit of a hiccup at the beginning of the show. Uh, we got it fixed a few minutes in there. And uh, just so you know, if you want to go back into the archives when this is all done and check out that first 10 minutes, uh, it's all good and golden in there. So. So uh, if you guys want to catch up on, on anything that you missed, uh, it's there. So, uh, Ramon, where were we? Um, Joe was... Um, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, where were you? I just had a... Well, we were, we were, uh, I was mentioning about how, uh, despite having uh, no sense at all of, of me having an enlightened state, I would, oh, yeah. say, I would say it's true that I am very, very vigilant of the quality of thoughts that enter my mind. I've, I've found that to be the most challenging thing that I've ever undertaken, and that is to, to actively look at every thought that comes in uh, and, and basically decide, is, is there value here? Is this something that is increasing my energy or decreasing my energy? Is it something that's pulling me into a, a, a state of, of fear and separation or something that's, that makes me feel like I, I have a, uh, a wholeness and connection with the people around me and, and the experiences that are, that are before me in the present moment. And, you know, it's amazing uh, in my experience how many times a day we have thoughts of attack, mm. how many times a day we have thoughts of grievance, how many times a day we have thoughts of fear or worry, all these things that really uh, serve us in no way, yeah. uh, but they, they do definitely de-energize us and carry us down a, a path that increases our stress, it, it accelerates the metabolic processes in our body that deteriorate our cells, that age us. Uh, that that bring on the manifestation of illness uh, physically, and it, you know, so we we just have so much baggage that we allow into into our minds. Uh, that's all. So, that's all. That's all reactive, though, isn't it? A majority of it. It's like uh, we're so reactive to, uh, and that's that's the programming. You know, the the societal programming that we go through as we're brought up in this world uh, to to just react instead of think about what what's going on and before, you know, uh, what's that one slip of the tongue in your deep shit <laughs> type thing, you know, yeah. uh, what, you know, why are, why are we so reactive like that? Is it just simply the programming or, uh, is it, I don't know. Well, I, uh, my opinion on this, and this is not only, you know, studying, uh, various what I feel are, are profound works. I, I would say uh, a work like A Course in Miracles, which is, I feel is a very profound uh, work of spiritual literature uh, and resonates strongly with me because in putting the principles to practice, I've, I've found there to be uh, a great deal of truth in what it speaks of. And, it, and it's that not only are we 
reactive and conditioned by what's, uh, you know, what our enculturation has been and what the, uh, the input is to us from media, from our, our social environment, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, virtually every interaction that we have with other people and with the environment around us has uh, rich opportunities to take us down a negative thought path. And, and that seems to be something that uh, has a, a deeper basis in the, uh, the human experience here where we tend to think of ourselves as a body first and then perhaps a mind inhabiting that body. Um, and then, you know, the last thing we give thought to is that perhaps we actually have a spiritual reality and that these, these you know, our mind and our body are, are vehicles for that primal spiritual reality. But we tend not to give that much, much thrift because what seems to be so much in our face are all of our physical urges, you know, what's, what's happening with this body that we, we all, you know, apparently have and, and that, you know, gauges, you know, all of our experiences filtered through it. So it seems to be the most real part of us. But, but I'm, I'm convinced it is not. Uh, in my own experience, um, these, uh, these spiritual, personally profound experiences have a, a tone of much, much more authentic, powerful reality than any physical experience I've ever had. Right. And uh, I've heard others speak of that same thing. And, you know, again, as a scientist, I, I've done a lot of self-experimentation in a lot of, way, in a lot of ways and a lot of different areas that would, would seem shocking to some people. But I have a very intense thirst for understanding and for knowledge. And so uh, I, I guess uh, I feel I'm fairly uh, unconcerned about what others may think about my, my journey and search for understanding. Uh, because there's, there's times where I've come under some pretty intense ridicule uh, for some experimentation that I've done. Uh, and, but I, I feel like, you know, I know what my own personal experience is. I know if it's provided me value and insight and, and lessons that I can, can take forward. And, uh, as a scientist, I'm looking to see, okay, if I, if I do this and, and the data that I get back, I'll <laughs> use the scientific jargon. If the data that comes back verifies the hypothesis, well, there's, there's some truth there. There's some right. connection there, especially if it's something that now you can predict. So, you know, I would say if, if you have, um, if you find that when you practice yoga and meditation, that it leads to a state of relaxation, a state of greater awareness, and better well-being in your life, and that experience is consistent, as a scientist, you could say, okay, this is predictable. This is, this is something that, that has truth to it. So why not go and apply that all the time and enjoy the benefits of that? And, and so to me at this point uh, in our society's evolution, anyone who questions the value of something like yoga, meditation, self-inquiry, prayer, uh, you know, group, uh, positive intention. Whoever, anyone who questions that, simply one, they're not doing any research, and but more importantly, they certainly aren't doing the experiment. You know, right. actually engaging themselves to see if there's something to this. And and I'm definitely one of these people who uh, it's not good enough for me to to hear someone else's testimony. Right. If I'm interested in what they're speaking of, I want to have a direct personal experience with it. And that, that goes to whether it's, it's uh, maybe an alternative uh, health therapy, whether it's something to increase awareness uh, and understanding, or whether it is meeting a person who I think is, uh, you know, has a compelling 
uh, story or or viewpoint, uh, you know, or teaching. You know, I'll I'll go and meet that person if if, if I can can do it. And you know, it, it, it's amazing to me how accessible all of these types of things are if we simply make the decision. You know, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to have that experience. I'm going to go meet that person. And, uh, you know, what what I found, you know, it's it, it there's a such a huge difference between uh, faith, belief and knowing you know there there's no substitute for knowing and you can only know through experience uh you know you're you're uh, you are, i'm like you in, in a lot of ways there uh, i suspect as far as you know the experimentation and and really uh to know this stuff you have to experience it and i've gotten to a point now where uh, you were talking about uh, how you know the thought processes that you you observe within yourself. Uh, I've actually gotten to the point now where I'm I can uh, predict uh, you know things for other people uh, just in a casual conversation with somebody. The the intensity of their negativity. Uh, I can I can see I can watch the mirror work the the universal mirror work on that person and watch that negativity come back to them in some form or fashion. It's it's just a, it's absolutely amazing uh, to witness this. Uh, you know, and and you can't you, you can't really tell them you know oh man this you're gonna you, this is gonna come back and hit you in the back of the head, uh, but uh, it, you know you have to work subtly on that kind of stuff to get them to to become aware of what's going on. But uh, it's, it's a phenomenal experience for me personally to, to watch this happen. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and my guess is that that probably didn't just spring into your experience. It's oh, probably no. something that you developed. It is, it's an inherent capacity that you've had. You've developed this through practice and paying attention to it, and you've been experimenting with it, which gotcha. to me is the scientific method. It's it's not yeah. new woo or new agey or anything like that. It's it's putting into practice the the results that you get from doing the experiment. And to me, that that is a uh, you know a very rich and powerful aspect of our prerogative of free will. We get to choose. If we're going to, to have one of these heightened experiences, we get to choose whether we learn the lesson. We get to choose whether we, we take the value from that lesson and, uh, and apply it and continue to enhance our lives. But at, at this point in my life, I know what I'm more interested in doing is taking whatever you know, little bit of wisdom I may have gained over my years and be of greater service. Mm. Because to me... That's the most enriching thing. It, 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 it's what really uh, excites me is, is, you know, getting together with people. Uh, you know, I love people. I, I so enjoy the, the experience of, of meeting people, hearing what they're interested uh, in, uh, sharing a meal with people who I've never met before, and, and really just showing up in a very present way and listening, right. listening. I know in yeah. a in a interview like this, I'm the one you know doing most of the talking. But but I, I think it's very important that we simply listen, be present, and and choose to extend ourselves on an energetic level in a in a a cord of friendship. Uh, call it love or a, a desire to see everyone as a brother and sister, which I believe we really are, because to me it's so fundamental that our source is the same. And if, and if that doesn't imply family at the most primal level, I don't know what does. And it seems self-evident that if we carry that energy, that friendly accord into every encounter we have, the concept of war, of domination, of, of serving ourselves at the expense of someone else, all of these distorted ego concepts, they fall away. They become absurd and ridiculous. And it, it's something that we simply will no longer tolerate in our own thoughts because it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, sticking yourself with needles. 
it becomes so uncomfortable that you can't tolerate that low energy thought, and it's self-reinforcing. You know, it doesn't mean that, that, that we don't still have to be very vigilant of our quality of thoughts. We do. That's a constant endeavor. But it, it's something that we're all capable of doing. It doesn't mean any of us are saints or holier than anyone else or whatever. I believe it just means that we've, we've been willing to, to focus ourselves in this area that has demonstrated itself to be of great, great value. It's, it's the pearl of great price beyond so many of these trivial distractions that we tend to indulge. I found that I have a, a underlying thought that is constantly on my mind, and that is the best and highest good. That is, it's, it's constantly in my awareness now, and I use, I use that as the foundation for all interactions with everybody. And that in itself, for me personally, uh, projects a, a very positive uh, a very positive energy uh, into all those situations. And I find that those, those real difficult, challenging uh, interactions that I, I've had throughout my life with other people and situations and et cetera, et cetera, all that kind of stuff, when I, when I really, this really sunk into my being and became part of who Tom is instead of uh, just a, an idea and an intellectual knowing, uh, when it really became part of who I am, uh, all those things kind of melted away, and uh, it's like like a smoothing out of the path. So, <laughs> so now when I, when I go into those uh, those uh, challenging conversations, you know, where, or those people that that I'm aware of their their, their uh, reactive natures, so to say, uh, I'm able to approach that situation with much much greater. Uh, efficiency as far as getting getting uh, a very uh, balanced and and uh, uh, beneficial communication going with them. So, well, and holding that intention of for the highest and greatest good of all, that becomes a silent blessing mm. that you're imparting to everyone you encounter, and that's so so powerful because. It, it's, I'm convinced, Tom and Ramon, it, it is our thoughts that are so much more powerful than our bodies. And that, that the field that extends you know, from, from our minds and, and goes out around us, that has very real impacts. Mm -hmm. If you are imparting this silent blessing, you know, because you, you, are, you are asking, praying, intending, uh, the highest good for everyone. That has a, a very positive, very measurable impact on those who are in that field. And there are amazing things that can happen. The, the, the recipient of that silent blessing does not need to be conscious of it at all. Right. But it still is being received by the part of them that is tuned into that. And because most of us still tend to be on a uh, kind of a, a mind frequency that is still consumed with the the lower level thoughts of, of you know everything is about my body uh, you know I'm more I'm so concerned about my self image I'm I'm so con concerned about you know uh, my worries of tomorrow or my regrets from yesterday and, and all of this kind of mental baggage that it, it covers over this much more primal and more powerful sensitivity that we have on that, the, the energetic level. You're broadcasting it to them. It's being received even if they're not aware of it. Well, that operates. That's operating you know, beneath the surface of all those, those ego thoughts. And it can result in, in very, very powerful transformations. And, right. I, and I very strongly believe it's the source of miracles. Mm, I really, really believe that. But, but beyond belief, like you mentioned, knowledge is beyond belief and faith. Right. And, and if yeah. you do the experiment and you see the results, that increases your conviction that it's true. And, and I will tell you from my own experience, these types of thoughts having a friendly accord on 
on a, a unspoken, quiet level, the blessing that's going out, that has miraculous implications in, in the very, very literal sense of the word. Yeah, you know what I find amazing. Um, I, I was with, I was hanging out with, with some scientists, and they were um, they were kind of making fun of, of the whole. Um, oh, what's that called? Oh man, it, you know where you take water and you like put the memory of a substance into the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, ho- homeopathy. Homeop- yeah, homeopathy. Um, and they were, you know, they were making fun of it. And I, and I said to them, and I said, you know, have you guys done any experiments with these? And I was like, no, because it's bogus. And I said, that's very unscientifically uh, of you guys. And I find that so much with the scientific community more than I, I do with just the average person. I think the average person would more than likely do the experiments and find out whether or not this is bogus. Um, See, that is that is a, a very accurate observation, and it, it mimics my own experience of, of observing the, the scientific community as a scientist. It has implications on the new energy field, which we'll, we'll start talking about in, in a little bit in more detail here. But see, the, the science community, what, what is it that typically tends to be a defining character of someone who is a scientist from the standpoint of, you know, they're, they're degreed or credentialed or whatever, and, and they work in the scientific circles. What tends to define it is, is that they have generally a, a, what might be looked at as a, a, a greater than average intellectual intelligence. Now, that does not necessarily mean that they have a greater than average social intelligence or a greater than average emotional intelligence or spiritual intelligence, which in so many cases where, where when scientists are steeped <laughs> in, in the, the material, uh, materialistic worldview and that everything just, it's only real if I can see it and touch it and measure it with instrumentation, that whole materialistic paradigm. Scientists often have the weakest spiritual intelligence. Right. Now, I can tell you that, that in a, a case like that, it makes the, the ego impulse uh, so much more uh, pronounced on the surface of someone's personality. So scientists are very keenly sensitive to ridicule of their credibility. And so, like, when you say, hey, you know, uh, I just saw the study that shows that, that prayer actually has real measurable effects, or that, hey, I just saw this study by this Japanese researcher named Emoto, who, who essentially, you know, put little labels on jars of water that, that said either something positive, like joy and peace, or they put something on it that said, uh, you know, I hate you, or you're ugly, and they, when he froze the water and analyzed the water crystals uh, with, with the photography, he found that the, the water that had had the labels that were very positive had very beautiful crystals, whereas the, the water that had the negative labels were all disrupted, uh, fractured, uh, and they were, they were actually ugly. They were ugly crystals. And, and that this is very repeatable, and others have repeated the experiment. Well, when, when you present that type of, of data to many uh, mainstream scientists, they will not even look at the data. No, not because, even. Because, because they're very, very concerned about what others in the, in the academic science community will think of them and, and what they will perceive as ridicule if someone challenges their, their credentials or their sensibility, all this. And, and it's, it's one of the most dismaying and damaging aspects of, of mainstream science when there no longer exists open inquiry, where the search for knowledge has boundaries. It should not have boundaries. It should be boundless. 
and it should have nothing to do with what one's peers think of us. And so when, when I meet scientists who have that inherent bias against things that are subtle, where the effects are, are energetic and more difficult to measure with conventional instrumentation, and where it requires going beyond the, the dogma of mainstream theory, that to me says, look, you, you're really throwing the scientific method right out, right out the door. Uh, yeah. how, can you, how can you claim to be a scientist now? And so the, the scientists who I have the, the deepest appreciation for, and I, I won't say the deepest respect, because I, I, I look at myself as respecting everybody, really, really respecting everybody, but I appreciate the ones who are aligned with a, an innocent search for truth right. and where they, they don't allow their, their ego fear of, of being left out of the club or being ridiculed or anything like that. They don't let those things dominate that search for truth. And, and to me, a scientist doesn't get to that point till they're willing to engage their spiritual faculties and start to experiment with their spiritual intelligence and develop it. Because if you don't have each of those, if you don't have some, you know, some intellectual intelligence, some emotional intelligence, some social intelligence, and some spiritual intelligence, if you're, if you're missing any of those to any substantial degree, you generally are not going to have wisdom. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. we're going to have to break off there, Joel. we uh, got a break coming up here. And, uh, and we'll give out the numbers after the... Def um, definitely, uh, they're, they're definitely uh, very left brain, and uh, I'll agree, they're book smart. They learn from the books and are able to parrot that, I suppose. So. Anyways, you're listening to Tom and Ron on 100 Punch Radio. We'll be back after the Good stuff, Joel. And uh, I looked in my rear view mirror. This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. Oh, please spare me a moment. Oh, you just jealous. <laughs> oh, welcome back to the Hundreds Monkey Radio. I hope you guys didn't hear Ramon singing there. I was going to say, you're listening to the Hundreds Singing Monkey. Oh, gee. <laughs> anyway, that's what we should do. We should get together a hundred monkeys, maybe like chimps or macaques, and make them teach them how to sing. There you go. You, have, of... you have fun with that. You got the monkeys <laughs> in Japan. They're not here in Washington, so uh, you let me know how that turns out for you, would you? <laughs> no, I don't know. I kind of see. Never mind. Anyway. So we're having a really awesome conversation with Joel Garbin here, and uh, uh, Joel, we, we were talking about the scientific community, and... Oh. Tom, before uh, we go into that, uh, just, just give out the numbers. Um, 213-233-3998. And uh, once again, that's 213-233-3998. Uh, give us a call and talk to Joe and us. Um, go ahead, Tom. So we were talking about scientific community, and, and during the break, uh, uh, we talked a little bit more about scientific community. And I, 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 I said that... Uh, uh, you know, the way I kind of see them is that they're really good at the memory exercises while they're in school. They're able to read the books and uh, then regurgitate that information they read out on the tests to be able to get their degree, and then they get jobs still on the company line. But on the other side of that coin, what I have noticed in the last, say, 10 years or so 
is that there are more and more coming out of that scientific community who are taking consciousness and spirituality into account in their results. Well, I, def I definitely agree with you, Tom, and it's a very encouraging trend that I'm seeing. Now, I have a lot of, of contacts in the, the science community where on a, a personal basis, I, it's very frequently for a scientist to, to confide in me that they are exploring consciousness, they're, they're experiencing a spiritual awakening, and that it's, it's greatly influencing the quality of their work and the innovation in their work. Uh, yet they are reluctant to reveal that to their colleagues, their mainstream colleagues. Again, because of that, uh, that hesitation that oh my gosh, am I, I'm going to get ridiculed and then I'm going to be outside of my peer circle. Is it going to affect my career because they, they, they think that, you know, I should be laughed at and, and, and this, you know, stalwart university that I work for, uh, you know, would be tarnished if they knew that, you know, suddenly uh, one of its uh, physicists uh, was known to to believe in God, <laughs> right. you know, something as radical as that, uh, you know. But but privately, I think there is a, a revolution going on. You know, if you were, you know, I've I've been in in some of these uh, professional circles before, like various conferences and things, where uh, I've noticed the same type of reluctance and hesitation for people simply to speak their truth clearly and with conviction. So, you know, if, 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 I, if I'm in giving a presentation to just a, a group of mainstream citizens, you know, non-technical folks, just, just a good cross-section of people, and I brought up a topic like, hey, do you believe that there's, uh, you know, extraterrestrial life, and do you believe that it's, you know, visited here or may, may be uh, having active visitation here? Generally speaking, you'll get a very honest response from, from that cross-section of our citizens. And, you know, you'll see generally, uh, you know, usually greater than 50% will respond positive to those questions as far as their belief that, yes, there's something larger going on than just here on planet Earth. But yet, if, if I'm at a conference where uh, it's mostly uh, scientific uh, circles, or professional circles where, you know, there's uh, like the, mostly the investment community there or the business community there, the answer to that same question would be you'd hardly see any hands that would go up in acknowledgement that, that they believe that, yeah, there's something larger going on because they're more concerned about who's going to be seeing their hand go up rather than speaking their truth and their conviction. And, and it, it's, it's a shame. I mean, it's, it's, it's very pathetic. So you have all these people with their, their personal belief is one thing, but then when it, it comes to them actually, you know, uh, being fearless and professing their, their belief, they're very, very timid and they're afraid. And it's such a, it's, it's such a, uh, a shame. And I, I would even say pathetic ego weakness that we do that because again you know this is how good men end up taking the path of destruction at someone else's order it's what happened in nazi germany they were good conscientious people who were good neighbors but then they yielded that to to peer pressure they yielded to to someone else who they perceived as, as having either authority over them or who, who dominated what was acceptable or unacceptable. Uh, and, they, and they basically just uh, allowed their own ethics and sensibilities and, and self-truth to be submerged. And so heinous atrocities occurred, and it occurs now. I mean, how many... How many of our people in the military, for instance, um, make a choice to get engaged in, in very, very destructive endeavors uh, that, that really, as private citizens, 
they would never think of going down that road because their sense of morals and ethics would never permit them to do that. But yet because now they're inside a system that we simply call military or government or whatever, suddenly we ascribe a whole different set of ethics and morals to the behavior that's executed because I'm now part of this institutional uh, wave. And, and so people subjugate their, their normal day-to-day morals and values to this, uh, this, this kind of uh, machinery of authority. And it allows good people, and I'm not, when I say allow, I mean they are making a conscious choice to subjugate themselves to this outside will or this outside perception or this outside message of, of what should be done. And, and so we find good people doing evil things all the time. This is happening. Good people doing evil things. And, and we've, we've got to get out of this pattern of, of subjugating what we know to be good, beautiful, and true to someone else's viewpoint and their criticism and, and their influence, uh, whether it, it's on social norms or institutional norms. We, we can no longer be doing evil because we're concerned about what other people will think of us. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I find that always mind-blowing. Um, I, I just can't get over the, the idea that you're going to call yourself a scientist and when I tell you, okay, for example, Tom did this experiment, um, it's the Emoto rice experiment, where you take three cups of rice, you put water, the same equal amount of water in each of them, you put a, a little paper, one that says love, hate, and ignore, and then, you know, every day you focus love on one, and then you focus hate on the other one, and you ignore the other one. When I tell them about the experiment, they just, their eyes glaze over and they just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just, like, this is, you know, it's like, this is scientific. Do it yourself. You know, show it to yourself. And, and the other part that I don't understand is the placebo effect consistently shows you that consciousness is a huge part of it. It outdoes the, the drugs all the time. Yes, yes. Yeah, just that in itself. You know, the placebo effect is an accepted and uh, acknowledged phenomenon. I mean, it, it's, it's everybody understands that the placebo effect is and does actually uh, cure people. So just that in itself should require, I mean, demand that consciousness be considered in all aspects of scientific exploration yeah but we but we generally the institutions don't follow that line of thinking because there's really there's no profit in it i know you see if we if we all were taught and then in doing our own experiments and and finding that our thoughts are extremely powerful. And so suddenly we started to use our minds to heal instead of, of medications. What would happen to the pharmaceutical industry? You know, right. if, we were, if we were using the power of our thoughts to, to provide you know, more abundant crops and, and, and really help, help to make the, the plant growth more vigorous, well, what would happen to the fertilizer industry? Why would we need genetically modified organisms or any of this stuff? You see, all of these things that acknowledge the deepest and most profound truths of the human capacity, uh, all of these, so many of these things tend to be uh, not favorable to current business infrastructures. Right. And so they become very critical of the mavericks who step outside that box and, and start to uh, become convicted of the, the larger truth. And so those scientists, uh, you know, conduct these experiments in consciousness at their own peril as far as remaining employed or receiving grant dollars for research, you know, and, and, and these other things that are part of the gravy train of material support for the, the science community. 
and it's it's really uh, it, it's really a shame that it's like that. But that that's kind of the the current reality of the way the money flows in mainstream science. It's also why we usually see scientific research focused on incrementalism. It's not really focused on the big breakthrough. It's focused on just a small conservative change of what already is accepted to be true because that's conservative, it's safe, I'm not going to get ridiculed for stepping out on the limb, and, and it's a shame. But it's also one of the reasons why the greatest breakthroughs tend to happen by people who are working in, with their, their own solo efforts in a garage or small little workspace somewhere or on a, a, a bench scale lab that, that is not connected to a mainstream institution of any kind. Those are the ones who are the real engines of the big breakthroughs. Right. And, and, it, and we, we, you, you see that in, you know, in the uh, high-tech world all the time. I mean, that's, those are the Paul Allens, the Bill Gates, you know, the Steve Jobs. Uh, you know, and in the breakthrough energy scene, it's the same thing. Most of these big breakthroughs are coming through from solar, uh, excuse me, not solar, but from solo inventors who are operating on, you know, small wisps of personal funding, and they're, they're generally, uh, you know, working in, in a vacuum as far as uh, having any other, other type of, of support. But they've, they've come across amazing, amazing evidences of, of, you know, breakthrough power where very little input energy uh, is is producing very very large output energy, and uh, you know it's th- this has been the case. The Wright brothers were the, the same example. You know, in their yeah. little bicycle shop, you know, they, they end up developing flight. And it wasn't until you know the president of the United States, you know, a couple years later after they'd already demonstrated flight, that the mainstream media and scientific community would even accept that it was real. Right. It, it, it's just uh, it's just such a such a shame that it was that scientifically it, proven not to be possible. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. So so Joel, what uh, this kind of uh, leads right into what your mainstay is that the the main push of your uh, you know the uh, uh, energy systems and stuff that you've been working on the websites and the the support that you've been giving those bench bench top inventors uh, is, would you tell us a little bit about those projects that you've got going on sure well as I mentioned at the beginning of the program uh, uh, I'm the president of a nonprofit called new energy movement and uh, you know your listeners can go to newenergymovement.org and take a look at what we're about and and there's a number of links to uh, to, to various things that can help educate uh, and, and one of these is a book that I co-authored with investigative journalist Gene Manning called Breakthrough Power. And in that book, which we use as, as one of the foundational educational tools uh, because it, is, it, it has such a rich amount of material in helping the non-technical public gain a grasp of what's going on behind the scenes in Breakthrough Energy that it really is the place to start. By, by simply reading that book, you get a, a very, very solid foundation in knowing not only what some of these technologies are that are outstanding and have great promise for us, but what the implications are for human society and our, and our whole planet and whether we make this transformation to a, a clean, abundant, inexpensive uh, energy infrastructure, or we stay on our, our current polluting fuel type of infrastructure with all the geopolitical and socioeconomic and environmental damages, uh, you know, that we witness all the time. <clears throat> we, we do not have to, to keep going down this path of leaving a very negative environmental footprint, uh, having resource wars over, over oil, <clears throat> having Fukushima type of uh, devastating accidents, uh, you know, in the nuclear uh, realm, uh, these things can, can be, become things that we put away and because there's, there's a whole, you know, new realm that's just waiting for us to, to embrace and adopt. But it begins with education. 
It begins with becoming aware. And that Breakthrough Power book is a, a great place to start. And you just go to the newenergymovement.org website, and you can, you can link to it uh, from there. But we have so many, uh, so many examples right now of technologies, and I want to mention a, a couple of them so people uh, gain a sense for, for what really is possible. So, you know, many people have heard about uh, cold fusion. And those who have been around for, let's say, you know, 40 years or, or longer in that age group, they'll remember cold fusion most likely as being something that was, uh, when it was announced back in 1989, was very quickly pronounced to be junk science. In fact, just a, a few weeks after the discovery had been announced, the New York Times, you know, had a blaring headline that said, you know, cold fusion was dead. And, and that, that buried this amazing science. So here were some frontier physics that, that basically had been totally subjugated to the mainstream physics thinking of the day and has largely been held at bay in the mainstream science community until this very day. Now, fortunately, there's been a number of, of, of very uh, credible and credentialed researchers that have, have carried on that work over the last 25 years and have made outstanding progress. So now today, there are a number of startup companies who actually have a cold fusion type of process uh, at the core of, of their, their company's mission. And, and in many cases, these technologies are using hydrogen and a, a powderized form of nickel to have a reaction occur that essentially causes a nuclear reaction at, at a relatively low temperature. And it, it yields an enormous amount of thermal output energy, heat. So with a small amount of input electrical energy to, to modestly heat up this reactor that has some, some powdered nickel and some hydrogen, uh, the, the technologies produce a large excess yield of heat. So this could become a tremendous way of taking care of the energy demand for heating water. And that is an enormous energy demand in our society. If you think about uh, all the different ways that we, we heat up water by, by burning a conventional uh, fossil fuel. Uh, the first thing that, you know, that comes to mind is, okay, if you're in a power plant, most of our power plants are burning coal or they're burning oil or they're burning natural gas or they're using a, a nuclear radioactive fissionable fuel like uranium or plutonium they're using these dirty fuels to create heat. That heat is used to boil water and produce steam, and then the, the motive power of that steam drives a turbine, which produces electricity. Well, now if, if all of a sudden we, we employ something like a cold fusion process, which produces a huge excess of thermal energy output compared to the small amount of electrical input to get the reaction going. We now have a much, much cleaner, smaller footprint type of, of process to produce that hot water to, to ultimately generate electricity. And, and probably some of the, the earliest applications for the, the cold fusion technologies will be for, for some commercial and industrial processes for, for hot water heating for other things besides electrical power generation. It, it would generally be to provide process heat for something like uh, a company that has a boiler that they're using to, to perhaps uh, heat up their chemical process uh, or to, to run their, their plant. Uh, like many in the, uh, you know, all of these pulp and paper mills, for instance, they use a lot of hot water uh, to, to uh, be part of the process of, of taking, you know, wood chips on one end and making, you know, saleable high-quality paper on the other end. Many of the chemical industry ha have to heat up their, their, you know, their chemical batches in order to, uh, to get the type of reactions that they need to make useful products as well. And many other types of industries, they're very dependent on hot water. 
in a household itself. You know, we each have a hot water heater somewhere in our in our basement, probably. Uh, we also have coffee pots that are you know heating up uh, you know hot water for a tea or coffee. So so that whole thing about heating water is a huge huge energy demand uh, that right now is the reason why we are burning so much of these dirty fuels in the form of coal, oil, natural gas, or, or fissionable radioactive nuclear fuel. So um, with, with the um, coal fusion device, especially the ECAT from uh, Italy, do they um, have they been able to get the patents um, in America? Because I know that that was one thing that it seemed like it was being blocked or, or they couldn't get get the patent in. Well, the, the historic position on that was that the when cold fusion was pronounced junk science, you know, back in 1989, the patent office shortly after that uh, basically said there would be no patents issued to any technology, to any patent application that, that made a claim around cold fusion. So just as, a, as an entire class of technology, boom, you just had that barrier come across. You know, That's like very lions. scientific. Yeah, yeah, so you had lions at the gate against a, a whole new class of technology. I mean, it, it's pretty unprecedented to, to have that. So, so that thwarted so much of the innovation because, you know, generally speaking, when an inventor comes up with something, in order for him to recover his investment of time and experimentation and, and personal funds he, he's put into his discovery, you know, he wants to, he wants to patent that and then hopefully uh, somehow be able to recover his investment and then actually, you know, produce some, some net, you know, positive material support. And, and most, most businesses that, that end up, the most inventors that apply for patent and receive one, the thing never even makes it to market. So the simple fact that you have a patent is, is a guarantee of nothing, really. But to actually have the, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office officially say, nah, you know, there's no, we, we are not going to recognize uh, any, any patent application that refers to cold fusion. And, and I have, I have uh, scientists who are inventors in the cold fusion realm who have very real processes that I've seen uh, who have been denied patents. So this isn't, you know, just some type of urban myth or conspiracy theory or something like this. I mean, this is this is a, a bona fide fact. Now, the good thing is that this is this is going, uh, you know, now that we have, you know, NASA has claimed to that that cold fusion is real. They've been doing, you know, at the NASA Langley facility, uh, you know, they've they've now been doing their own experiments and have made public proclamations that that really real science. Yes, uh, and the uh, the U.S. Naval Research Labs, they they have for years uh, shown the results from their experiments that that also you know demonstrate that cold fusion science is real. So so at this point in time, there's been such a uh, a political entrenchment that you know for for scientists in the Department of Energy, for instance, to now suddenly have to to turn around and acknowledge that cold fusion is real would be a huge embarrassment. So when the public suddenly says, why the hell have we lost 25 years of development of this technology? Joe, sorry, uh, hold yeah. that thought. We're going to go on break. You're listening to the 100th Monkey Radio Show with Tom and Ramon and Joe Gordon. Uh, Garvin, sorry. Um, uh, Check us out on the uh, flip side. Uh, don't forget to check out our website, www.100thmonkeyradio.com. or they have good information. Now one more time before I go One last thing you need to know, my friend You want to keep it calm 
complicated It's really all quite simple in the end Ah, welcome back to the Hundredth Monkey with Tom and Ramon and Joel Garbin. And uh, man, you know, there's there's uh, just so much going on out there in the energy field. And Ramon and I have been, uh, especially since we started this show, for for me, I, you know, I, I I looked at it a little bit prior to uh, Ramon and I doing the show. Uh, but since then, you know, we've been paying pretty close attention to what's going on out there. And I am just absolutely amazed with uh, some of these brilliant, intuitive people that are, are, I mean, I'm just like, oh, my God, how did these guys figure this stuff out? And uh, then we, we talked about how, how difficult it is to get this stuff out and what is really encouraging to me right now is some of these programs in, and uh, uh, that are out there for uh, support, for helping people to actually be able to come up with the funds they need for equipment to do the experiments, for funds they need to produce that documentary, for funds they need for you know whatever they, it is that they're working on that, that they want to get out to the world. Uh, you know, if they throw out some information and say, this is a really good idea, I need some help. And it's just, a, it, and that's what it is. It's people asking for help and other people listening. Uh, and, and Joel, I know that you've uh, got several projects that you're working on also. Uh, would you care to share some of those with us, please? Yeah, the, you know, if, if folks go to uh, the New Energy Movement website at newenergymovement.org, uh, there's several things that you can you can link to there that will help you get an idea of the work that we support, uh, the uh, some initiatives we're taking for educational outreach. I'd like to mention specifically that we've, we've just uh, uh, launched a crowdfunding initiative to help us get some uh, some trade show materials that our our frontline activists, uh, can use for you know as displays at various uh, fairs and conferences, trade shows, you know events where a lot of people are gathering, so we can get the word out on education. So so if if you feel that any of the things that we've been discussing tonight strikes a chord with you, and that that this whole new energy scene is important, I really ask you to consider supporting that effort support this crowdfunding effort to, to help us get some of these trade show uh, booths and materials so that we have a nice you know uh, you know nice professional way to uh, to interact with the public because uh, we, we find that that pr- that will provide us a lot more uh, leverage to to be able to have you know, materials on display that can be handed out and, and for people to come and, and have a, a, a direct live interaction with some of our activists here. Um, some other really uh, great things that are going on. There's a number of conferences that are related to the breakthrough energy field that are coming up this summer and fall. And I wanted to mention a, a couple of those here. First, uh, over in Idaho in June, uh, there's the John Bedini and Peter Lindemann conference uh, that will be talking about uh, how people can actually build some magnetic motors that really work. Uh, these are amazing devices that, that were the result of John Bedini and, and Peter Lindemann's research. Uh, these these are, are really solid people. Uh, they're doing great work in that they're not just trying to take their development to market, but they're teaching other people how to replicate it. And that's, that's hugely important that, that we start to proliferate the knowledge, the understanding into a larger, uh, you know, brain trust out into into the, the the citizen mind. So, so I encourage you to check that out. In any of these conferences, you can also find by just going to the newenergymovement.org website, click on the conference tab, and you'll be able to, to find more information on this. There's also the annual Tesla Tech conference called the Extraordinary Technology Conference. Uh, that's held every July in Albuquerque, and that's always a really good one to go to. And you can see a number of inventors that are demonstrating their devices. A lot of interesting papers on some of the latest research going on in breakthrough energy. 
And then, then in October, uh, specifically October 10 and 12 in Boulder, Colorado, one of our, our sister organizations called the Breakthrough Energy Movement uh, will be hosting with New Energy Movement a, a conference that's, that's going to really help show what the, the latest is going on in this breakthrough energy field, uh, including a lot of the social implications that are going on, environmental implications, how do citizens get involved to help make this transformation come about. And I really highly encourage anyone who can to get to that, that October conference. And again, all these things you can you can find at the conference tab at newenergymovement.org. Now, there's a, a number of, of companies that are are starting to uh, get launched around various new energy technologies. I mentioned some of these cold fusion technologies. Some of the companies that you'll find here, there's a startup called Brill Lewin Energy uh, that's uh, headquartered uh, down in the Bay Area in the state of California, and uh, they've, they've announced that they're seeing, you know, about a, you know, uh, for every unit of electrical input to their process, they're getting out two units of energy in the, in the form of heat. Uh, there's another technology called Sonofusion um, that is uh, being pioneered by uh, the inventor Roger Stringham, who's over on the island of Kauai. This is a process I'm very intimately familiar with. Uh, Roger and I have, have had many meetings going over his technology, um, and he's presented this to the American Physics Society's annual conferences each of the last three years and the American Chemical Society uh, annual conferences. And he's been peer-reviewed. His technology right now shows a, a uh, three times as much output energy in the form of heat compared to the amount of electrical energy input to, to get the reaction going. Um, so there's, there's, there's two different efforts. Uh, there's several others. You had mentioned, uh, Tom, about the, uh, uh, the Rossi, uh, Andrea Rossi, the Italian inventor, and his ECAT technology, which has gotten a tremendous amount of press over the last year or so uh, because he, has, he, he, he claims to have a, a commercial device ready to go that, that can produce a very large scale power output. Um, so it's not, it's not a, a bench scale type anymore, but actually uh, an industrial size process. And he's undergoing a uh, third party vetting by various uh, university physicists over in, um, in Europe uh, right now. In fact, they're, they completed their assessment and their, their paper on, uh, the published paper on their results supposed to come out in late April. So that's going to be coming up very, very soon. I'm real uh, curious to hear that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, that'll be, uh, you know, that'll be really good breaking news here coming up very shortly. Uh, there's, there's also some things going on in the magnetic motor realm of technology. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I have a colleague, Sterling Allen, uh, who not only serves on the New Energy Movement Board of Directors, but he has the uh, the, the Pure Energy Systems Wiki site, uh, PES Wiki, P-E-S-W-I-K-I, and he's investigating a magnetic motor uh, technology development um, that uh, was developed by a Turkish inventor named Yildiz, and, uh, and that particular inventor is demonstrating his magnetic motor technology over at a Geneva's Inventor Expo um, as we speak. And Sterling is over there documenting that demonstration, so we expect to get some uh, some some good feedback coming out of that out of there uh, shortly. Uh, there's there's a, another technology <clears throat> that's very very interesting that is essentially a self charging energy chip. This is something that looks like a silver dollar, and what it is is it's it's a uh, uh, it's a, a circular disk that is composed of nano layers of various materials, and it has this peculiar property where it builds up a voltage with no no input, no wires, builds up a voltage, and that voltage can be can be discharged, and then it, it then it, it very very quickly 
uh, builds back up its voltage again. It seems to be harvesting, uh, you know, electrons from the ambient environment and, and making this into something that, that can produce usable power for microelectronics. That's a very exciting technology uh, because this is something that could be used to, to power perhaps, you know, cell phones, uh, you know, small electronic uh, devices of various sorts. That sounds uh, a lot it, like, uh, have you seen the, the stuff that John Hutchinson's been doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm very, very familiar like, with John. That sounds yeah. a lot like the stuff that he's been doing with uh, his crystal concoction. Right, right. John's, John's had a, a crystal converter uh, technology for a long time that it is comprised of various materials that, you know, when it's heated up, it, it, it has some of that same self-charging characteristic. And John's a fascinating inventor, uh, and some, some may be aware of him uh, and, and what's called the Hutchinson effect, which is, which is where um, in John's laboratory he's been able to, to demonstrate to many, many people, uh, myself included, on two, two different occasions, an anti-gravity effect. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, even to see ice cream come, you know, go vertical out of a, an ice cream cone you know, so we're not even talking of having to be magnetic materials uh, or metal or anything like that. It, it, it's very, very fascinating and unusual. Uh, and and John, John is, uh, you know, one of these uh, you kind of self-taught uh, scientists, inventors, uh, very, very interesting man. Um, and if you ever have a chance to meet him, it, it's it's quite a treat. Uh, he, he's a really good-hearted gentleman as well. Uh, yeah, a real we, we had him on the show here last year. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, amazing yeah. guy. Uh, so yeah. you were able to, you, you actually witnessed the anti-gravity stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, on a couple of occasions. Uh, John has, John Hutchison has this very, uh, <laughs> uh, very unique uh, dwelling. It, it's an apartment that is loaded with electronic equipment that is suspended <laughs> from the ceiling. It comes up from the floor. Uh, it's like, it's like working your way through a maze as you're, you're, you're ducking and squeezing through the passageways in his apartment to get to the experimental room, uh, you know, where he's, where he has all of, uh, you know, his, uh, his instruments. He's no, he he's no stuff. longer in BC. Oh, he has moved recently then, it sounds like. He's in Oregon now, yeah. Oh, he is. Okay, well, I'm in Portland. I ha haven't seen him here yet, uh, but, but certainly I'm sure we'll be hooking up soon. Uh, but, but I was introduced to John by Gene Manning, uh, who's my, uh, the co-author of the Breakthrough Power book, and Jean's been one of my primary mentors for many years. She's, she's been a long-term investigative journalist and researcher in the new energy field going back now almost 30 years and has written extensively on developments that are, that are going on in this field. She's just an amazing lady and, and just a dear sister. And, um, and she has so many connections and relationships with, with various inventors um, and uh, John was one of those who's a close friend of hers. So I was I was delighted to have a chance to to get to know John directly. So there's lots of things going on. I mean, it's it's becoming increasingly difficult to stay on top of all the developments in this field, which is which is itself very very exciting and encouraging, uh, because that means that there's not just one little effort going on here or there, just a few, but this is a worldwide phenomenon now. Where, where, you know, new energy developments are popping up like, you know, like dandelions all over the planet. And, and that portends great things uh, because, you know, some of the, uh, you know, some of the activities that have held these technologies at bay for, you know, well over a century, I, I think now are finally going to be embraced and adopted um, yeah. you know, by, by mainstream institutions and um and, and I'd really like to see many of these technologies be open sourced and and become distributed, uh, decentralized power sources that that businesses and homeowners can can eventually use and no longer be dependent on the grid. And and where we all have our own you know energy devices that uh, you know that we're 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 controlling the amount of power that we're generating with some of these clean. Uh, advanced technologies, because uh, that's where I see that that this is all 
you know, all headed eventually. Our, our grid system is, is very antiquated. It's highly, highly vulnerable to a number of different influences that can take it down in an instant and put millions of people at a time in the dark, just like we've seen with, with Sandy, with Katrina, uh, with examples where there have been uh, solar bursts and coronal mass ejections from activity on the sun that, that, that result in these electromagnetic pulses that, that take down huge portions of the grid and, and, and leave millions of people without power for up to weeks or even months. Um, you know, and, and, and our, our system is so vulnerable to not only these things that are, are weather-influenced, uh, you know, uh, solar-influenced, but also can be influenced by access of, of uh, cyber sabotage. Uh, as the grid becomes more interconnected, more dependent on computer systems, it makes it that much more vulnerable to the hacking activities that are going on between nations. Um, and, uh, you know, and worse. I mean, we hear about, you know, all the saber rattling going on in North Korea right now with their nuclear capabilities. You know, if any rogue nation or, or any, uh, you know, group of, of ill-minded folks who acquired nuclear weaponry and they did a high-altitude nuclear burst, that electromagnetic pulse could take down huge portions of, of the, the, the grid system and, and really devastate a nation in a hurry, whether it's the United States or any other country that has a large grid system. And everything would suddenly grind to a halt. Uh, you know, and that means the pumping of water, which most communities are dependent on electrical pumps to get their water, whether, whether it's hospitals, whether it's electricity for, for everything done in our home, refrigeration, uh, you know, heating water, heating the home, uh, having lights, uh, you know, uh, being able to, to transport uh, our food, uh, you name it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, everything will grind to a halt. And we are so ill-prepared for something like that. It, it, would, it would just cripple our nation. Yeah. I would, you know, like, we, I would like to see all that energy out there, that, that those little devices, those home devices out there, just for the fact that I'd be able to see all those telephone poles and all those freaking wires strung up all over the place. Uh, I mean, they, they, they're, uh, they're flat out ugly, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, we could really uh, bring the garden back, you know? It, it something that's yeah. uh, sustainable and that is uh, eco-friendly, that is, you know, uh, you know let's have something that, that has beneficial effects along with the power generation you know what about that joel uh, i know there's some technologies out there at least where people are making claims that there are there are other benefits along with you know radiant energy benefits along with the the power generation uh, oh yeah and i i love i love that vision tom you are so right on that if, if we were able to have distributed power and i'm not talking you know solar panels and and, and a, a windmill, uh, you know, that type of thing. I'm talking about a device that you could, you know, plug into the circuit breaker in your home and, and power up your, you know, your own electrical system in the household without having to hook up to the grid uh, or something that's portable where you could take with you and, and plug into your electric car and, and you wouldn't need to charge it up. I mean, this is what's coming down the pike, and uh, it's, it's very, very exciting. So, so you talk about being able to remove, you know, the, all these wires and telephone poles that blight our landscape and that are always bathing us in this electromagnetic field, which, which some research shows has, has negative health impact, impacts. But definitely that system of power poles and, and electrical lines strung, you know, millions of miles across, you know, the United States, you know, those things are very, very vulnerable. Every time there's a thunderstorm, every time a tree falls down, or there's a snowstorm, you know, big, big chunks of various cities in the countryside are without power because we, we, have, we have all this vulnerable infrastructure. And it is flat out yeah. ugly. I totally agree with you. Brian O'Leary called that the electric jail <laughs> because those <laughs> wires were, 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 like, were like bars overhead of us. And, and my neighborhood... And, and, you know, near downtown Portland is no different. There are so many wires strung everywhere. It's just, just crazy. 
yeah, but some some sense. of these other developments, though, uh, that are water based, have the ability to clean the water to a high degree and produce excess energy at the same time. So water has become increasingly scarce as the population has grown um, around the planet. And, you know, we, fresh water comprises such a small amount of the total water resources on the planet. It's somewhere like around, you know, 3% of the water on the planet is actually fresh water. And of that 3%, we actually can only access about 1% to meet human needs because most of that fresh water is either locked up in ice or it's locked up in, in unreachable, unreachable aspects of groundwater, you know, various, various aquifers. And, and so we have this precious tiny amount of fresh water that, that we depend on for drinking, uh, you know, for irrigation, for, you know, uh, all things related to sustaining human life here. And it's such a precious resource. So anything that helps us to extend that resource or allows us to purify water out of seawater, you know, through desalination and things, uh, will be a, be a huge step forward. Or imagine a technology that will be able, able to harvest clean, pure water right from the atmosphere itself just kind of like, like the way a dehumidifier will, but instead of having to put a lot of electrical power in, like you do have to do in a, a, a conventional dehumidifier, you know, these devices would be harvesting energy directly from the, the ambient environment itself and producing mm-hmm. clean water at the same time. So these are the types of things that are, that are coming down the pike. There, there was an analogy you said that, um, that I loved and, and I want to go over that. And that was the whole thing with the uh, dandelion, um, you know, popping up like dandelions. And what's amazing about the dandelion is it has a root that is about uh, one meter long. And when you pull the dandelion, it leaves this little string behind which allows it to grow through again. That's why you see them pop up through, through the cracks in the streets and, and if you lay down pebbles it, it grows right through it so i i'm seeing the same analogy with you know with the energy it's like they pull the the weeds out and they pull the the dandelion out but it's still more of them are growing out and growing out so no matter how many times these companies try to pull these these um inventors out you know buying them out killing them or, or scaring the crap out of them um, that's, still, that's a, that, yeah, that's a great analogy, Ramon. And I look at those roots and the tendrils that come off of those roots. To me, those are the interconnections that people are making through shows like this right now that you guys are hosting, which, which is a great venue to get the word out to people. Uh, it's through things like what our organization, New Energy Movement, does in connecting people with information and in, in providing advocacy to the inventor community itself. There's many, many other organizations out there who work in concert with New Energy Movement to help, to help uh, support the development of these technologies or help with the educational efforts or help bring advocacy or bring down barriers to the inventor community. Uh, something that, you know, I, I know many of your audience should, are, are aware of the Thrive Movement and, and the wonderful documentary Thrive that Foster and Kimberly Gamble have produced, and I, I heartily recommend that. Uh, you know, if, if you're not aware of it, you can you can link to it from the NewEnergyMovement.org website. You know, another another uh, organization doing doing great stuff, um, I believe, is, is Stephen Greer's group, and with his Serious Disclosure Project. And that the new film Sirius, which is going to debut in Los Angeles on April 22nd, is going to make a tremendous uh, case for the link between advanced energy and propulsion technologies that could transform this planet. And uh, and Dr. Greer, who he's a he's a personal friend of mine as well, uh, his intention is to take proceeds from that from that documentary film and use them to build a new energy lab, which is, which is a resource that's very, very much needed for the inventor community to have a, a safe haven to, to, 
develop these technologies and tap into the brain trust of other other brilliant uh, scientists and, and inventors who have insights for how to move these things forward. And it'll help bring the Tiger teams together to move these things to market uh, much more rapidly. So we just got a minute left, Joel. So uh, if you want to share your uh, websites and stuff again, where, and your book and where people can get all this stuff, uh, one minute. Yeah, great. Thank you. So uh, our organization, New Energy Movement, you can, you can see all kinds of great stuff there at newenergymovement.org. Uh, check out the, the link to the Breakthrough Power book there, which is, which is the single best educational resource for people to become familiar with what's going on in the new energy field. Uh, and please uh, consider supporting new energy movement uh, you know, with the donation. We are reliant upon the, the public support to help us execute our mission of education and inventor advocacy in helping to move these technologies forward. And we also have a crowdfunding initiative on our site to help us get some educational outreach materials to improve our efficiency. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening tonight and uh, all the support you guys give uh, Ramon and I and the 100th Monkey Radio and all the other shows uh, out there doing similar work. Uh, we love you guys, and condemnation without investigation is heights of ignorance. Come on. The love you deny is the pain you carry. I don't know what happened to Ramon there. I'm sorry, I was saying it with a mic off, and I'm scrambling to say it. The love you deny is the pain you carry. No, I'm <laughs>